The weather is cooling down a bit. The leaves are starting to fall. Yes, it's that time of year again. Football season. And we all know the best part of any game day traditions are the ones that involve food. There's nothing like having everyone in your game day crew coming together to bring their best bites and argue over whose family makes the best chili. And while there's no need to mess with the perfection of game day classics, like a freshly grilled Oscar Mayer hot dog topped with Heinz ketchup and mustard, it's always fun to step out of your comfort zone and get creative with your recipes. Because there's nothing more fun than adding to your list of game day traditions, like making a creamy and delectable queso dip with Velveeta cheese that can be eaten with so much more than just chips. Now is the chance for people across the nation to find out whose game day eats reign supreme. It's your turn to show off your tasty game day food traditions. Go to www.gamedayfoodtraditions.com to share a photo of your game day food tradition to enter to win $10,000. Once again, that's www.gamedayfoodtraditions.com to enter to win $10,000. Content warning. This episode discusses murder and violence. Kevin and I have both been working on the Burger Chef murders case for many years at this point. And sometimes we find ourselves spiraling because there are so many different scenarios, so many unknowns. It could be difficult to piece together what exactly happened to the four victims, Jane Freet, Ruth Shelton, Danny Davis, and Mark Flemons, because we're just essentially paralyzed by minutia. So recently, we got the idea, why don't we bring some of these questions that we have to our audience and we can hear directly from you and hear what your scenarios are, what your thoughts are, what your questions are, and maybe go forward from there because maybe that could inspire in us some ideas on how to maybe lock down on a probable scenario about some of the remaining questions about what happened to those four kids who, of course, were abducted from a Burger Chef restaurant in Speedway, Indiana, in between the nights of November 17th and November 18th, 1978, and driven down 20 miles to Johnson County and murdered in a wooded area there. So today we're going to be reading out different questions and comments from listeners about some of the subjects that we've discussed on the case so far. When we got permission, we'll read their first name or we'll refer to them however they want to be referred to. But I just want to stay at the start that we got so many wonderful responses to some of our questions. And we want to sincerely thank everybody who participated in this because you are deeply helpful to us. <laughs> and you're making us think. And um, so thank you. Thank you to everyone. And if any of these statements jog memories or jog thoughts for you on the case or the questions that remain in the case – please email us at murdersheet at gmail.com. We want to hear from you. Let us know if it's okay to use your first name or if you want to use a nickname or something or if you just want to be anonymous. But we want to hear from you. We'd like to keep doing episodes like this where we're kind of crowdsourcing some discussion. I will just also note that if you were a person in the Speedway area or the west side of Indianapolis or even, even other parts of Indianapolis in 1978, in the 70s, in the early 80s, who was either just a normal teen or maybe somebody who is maybe involved in the drug trade, let us know. We're not narcs. We're not trying to get anyone in trouble. We just want to know more about the drug ecosystem that was at play back then. And, and let me also make the point that even if we wanted to, even if Anya just lied to you, which, <laughs> which she didn't, uh, there's statutes of limitations in effect. You're not going to get prosecuted if you were involved with the illegal drug trade in the late 70s. Nobody cares about those kind of crimes. They're just too old and you can't be prosecuted because if you're just involved in drugs, the statute of limitations is long past. So, But what you can do if you were involved in the drug trade, you can come to us. We will keep you anonymous if you want. Nobody needs to know that you were involved in the drug trade. We're not trying to embarrass anybody. But you might have information. You might not even realize that the information you have pertains to Burger Chef. Here's how it is, because drugs are a business. There are different operators. There are different players. There are different styles of the business. We've looked into drug gangs associated with Burger Chef that were totally nonviolent. They were very professional Nobody got hurt. That was the goal. And we've also looked into drug trades associated with Burger Chef who were incredibly violent. So we just want to understand what were the operators? What were the players? You know, are there any gangs where it's like, oh, no, they would have never used violence to do anything? Are there gangs where it's like, oh, yeah, they, you know, 
they could have done this or, you know, I could see a spinoff of this group doing it or, you know, was there a was there a dispute over marijuana, you know, rights going on at the time? We just want to know everything. So you would be incredibly helpful to us if you were speaking out on those issues. We will keep you anonymous. We won't use you on the show without your permission. We just want to know. And if you're if, again, if you're worried about being judged, as I've talked about on the show, I'm a recovering alcoholic. You will not be judged for participating in in something like a drug racket because, you know, again, this was a very long time ago. My name is Anya Kane. I'm a journalist. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. I'm an attorney. And this is The Murder Sheet. We're a true crime podcast focused on original reporting, interviews, and deep dives into murder cases. We're The Murder Sheet. And this is You Never Can Forget, Keys and Closings. We're going to start out with a question that's actually a question that's pretty easy to answer. Uh, a listener named John asked, one thing I never understood, you never can forget. Why that title? And let me say before we answer this that I've been in the same position because there was another podcast about the Burger Chef murders called the 3C Podcast. And early on, I believe they did an episode called something like, we work really hard. And I was like, why are they putting that in the title? This doesn't make sense to me. Because I'd been focused so much on the murders, I wasn't really looking at the Burger Chef restaurant chain itself. You Never Can Forget was part of a company jingle for Burger Chef. So the As was the phrase we work really as hard. As was so but so the work we work really hard is from a commercial and then there was a song Open Wide America, You Never Can Forget. You get more and more and more to like at Burger Chef. So that's where we I basically we thought it sounded I mean, I thought it sounded kind of poetic because, you know, in the Indianapolis area has not forgotten these four. We don't think you ever should forget uh, Jane, Ruth, Danny and Mark. But we we just sort of wanted to go with that. Um, I mean, if we were smart, we probably would have called it the Burger Chef murder something because then people would probably click on it more. But that's what we get for trying to be artsy. And also that was our first episodes. Yeah, those are our first few episodes. And, you know, two listeners, Steve and Lydia, suggested that we eventually compile a cliff notes for Burger Chef. We're going to work on that. Absolutely. It's a very complicated story. It's incredibly complicated. It is ridiculously complicated, this story. And there's certainly been times when even we have gotten confused about it. So I think we're going to work on something where basically we say, here are the facts everyone agrees on. Here are a few of the theories. An anonymous listener recommended that people listen to our You Never Can Forget episodes in order. Not bragging, but this is the most in-depth dive currently out there on Burger Chef. You know, we, we go very deep into it. We cover the basics, but then we get into minutia and and some intriguing possibilities. If you go to Art19, which is our website, so Murder Sheet Art19, and type in You Never Can Forget, you'll find all of the episodes there. And that's a way to kind of put them all together. And if you go to and join our Facebook discussion group, you can, there's a spreadsheet that our wonderful moderator put together there of all the Burger Chef episodes. So you can also use that. Yeah, we cover all of the theories in uh, a lot of detail. I think it's a very interesting case. It's also something of a frustrating case because there are so many theories about what happened. And there's so much evidence that you can plausibly argue for any of three or four different theories. Yes. So let's jump into some of the questions that we've recently posed to listeners. The first section of questions that we're going to talk about is essentially, how did Jane's car come to be parked by the park and speedway? Let's clarify what exactly we're talking about here. 
Jane Freet was the assistant manager of the Speedway Burger Chef. She was the boss in charge the night that the kids were abducted from the restaurant. And she was one of the murder victims, of course. One wrinkle of the case that has always been hard to wrap our heads around is that she drove a white Vega. She would drive that to work. The Vega was missing from the parking lot when employee Brian Kring came to open, came to find the burger chef deserted around midnight. So he gets there. He sees nobody's there. And also Jane's car is there. Danny Davis, one of the other victims, his Pinto is still in the parking lot, but Jane's car is gone. So what happens to Jane's car? Well, it was discovered, I believe, around 4 a.m., and it is parked next to a nearby park, which is also across the way from the Speedway police station. One interesting wrinkle about this is, you know, your first instinct is, well, they drove Jane's car to the murder site and that was the abduction vehicle. And then they drove it back and parked it at the park. But that could not have happened. We know this because the odometer had been checked. Jane had taken her car in for service very recently. The odometer was checked and there were not enough miles to say that they went to the murder site and back. So that couldn't have happened. So it's always been like, how did her car end up there? Was it used to abduct the kids from the burger chef, and then they were transported in a secondary vehicle, and like it was dropped off there. Uh, did she drive out there to meet somebody? Get high, you know, get kidnapped, brought back to the burger chef. We don't know. So we're gonna share some of the thoughts that you shared about this. Maybe get our brains all jogging a little bit. A listener named Nikki asked, "What service or problems did Jane have with her car? Did it start and run when the police found it? Could she have broken down?" We've never heard that the car was found to be broken down. My understanding, and uh, I'm not a thousand percent on this, but my understanding that the servicing was something basic like getting an oil change. Yes, it was not like a serious, serious repair. And Nikki also theorizes that perhaps Jane's car was never even at Burger Chef that night. Uh, She writes, I've always had it in my head that she may not have wanted someone to know she was at work that night. It's a very interesting theory. It's an interesting theory. We can share that. So Jane had a boyfriend at the time. So in recent years, he's told us that Jane seemed pretty off that day. She seemed down. For what it's worth, in the initial FBI documents that we recently uncovered, he doesn't say anything like that. He he didn't he didn't say, oh, she seemed depressed. He's he's since told us that. So just flagging that the, the story has changed or at the very least, maybe he's had more time to think over more details Maybe some things that didn't seem like a big deal at the time when she was just missing took on a different clarity when she was found murdered. So we don't know if she was hiding for someone. I I would say that enough people, I believe, saw her car there that night and it was unusual enough to see it missing with the lights of the burger chef still on that I think her car was there. But this is a very interesting point and it speaks to something which is could Jane have been worried about something could she have been targeted in some way a listener named lisa asked did jane do a bank drop after her shift so she, you know would deposit the day's money in an outside deposit box for the bank you know could she have been intercepted essentially we actually looked into some there were some um, robberies of fast food joints in the 70s in the indianapolis area that actually were targeting managers leaving with money and so that's something that's come to our minds as well. One thing that's worth pointing out is that when authorities got to the restaurant, they saw lots of loose coins on the floor and about 500 some dollars was missing from uh, the safe. That suggests that perhaps her bank drop hadn't been made yet. Yeah, and if we're wrong about that, we we might check back with some of our sources and see if they have different information about that. But the fact that so many hundred dollars were missing, we always sort of assumed that she had not made that at that point. Good question, though. A listener named Brian said, Jane may have driven the car herself to the park for a pre-arranged, for a prearranged meeting with someone who basically were the murder suspects. And then they all just left her car there at the park and went back to the burger chef in a different vehicle. Yeah, this this possibility comes to mind. This scenario would make sense if perhaps Jane was the target or there's always been rumors about Jane owing money 
or someone close to Jane, i.e. her brother Jimmy Freed, owing money. Now, Jane did not have a record. Jane was a pretty, you know, on the surface, clean cut person who was serious about her job at Burger Chef. And, you know, she was not in the drug trade heavily. Some people claim different, but a lot of the people who knew her well say, no, absolutely not. Her brother, Jimmy, was heavily into the drug trade, though, heavily into cocaine trafficking and eventually was arrested for that. One possibility that fits Jane not being in the drug trade is that somebody was out to get her brother. She tries to help him and then she becomes a target. Maybe she's lending him money or maybe maybe that's not enough. And they say, let's go back to the burger chef and empty the till and things escalate from that. Yeah. And for what it's worth, one of the burger chef employees has since said it wasn't unusual for Jane to leave the premises after closing and then come back. So perhaps she had a regular meeting with somebody, or perhaps uh, she, as Anya suggests, went to the park to meet with someone and that, that someone said, we need more money and money's at the restaurant. So she is forced to go back to the restaurant. There's all sorts of possibilities. A listener named Allison said her hypothetical is they separated the employees into two groups. So basically there are two two perpetrators, two groups of three go in different vehicles. So you have two employees and a perpetrator in one vehicle and then two employees and a perpetrator in Jane's vehicle. And then at some point when they figure out a spot to just drop off Jane's car, they stop and then everyone goes into the secondary vehicle. This is actually something that fits with Alan Pruitt's story. He claims to have seen Jeff Reed abduct the two boys, force Mark and Danny into a van, and Timothy Willoughby force Ruth and Jane into Jane's car. So it seems, I mean, it's a bit complicated, but it does match with what somebody said. Obviously, there are many problems with Pruitt's story on a number of levels, so we don't take that as gospel, but it it certainly accounts for the movements of the car, just kind of confusing about why they would do it that way as as long as we're on this subject allow me to muddy the waters even further we know that at about the time the four people were being forced from the burger chef nearby uh maybe a half mile or so away a car is pulled over by the police for erratic driving And the person in that car has a loaded gun, a loaded 38. And unseen by police, this person throws it out the window. So some people have theorized that this person in this vehicle, who we've interviewed on the show. We called him Terry, I believe. I believe. They have theorized that perhaps he was involved with the crime. Perhaps he was either a lookout or perhaps he was intended to be a getaway driver. And if your getaway driver is intercepted by police, then maybe you have to steal a car. Yeah, you freak out. One thing I will note further is that there's a robbery gang at the heart of this case where they were knocking over different fast food restaurants on the south side of Indianapolis at the time, KFCs and burger shops. The theory centers around a group of men, Greg Steinke, Tim Piccioni, Dave Cathcart, S.W. Wilkins, and John Deffenbaugh. There's problems with this theory, too, but it's definitely very interesting. When we researched some of their robberies, it indicated that they didn't, they didn't like, drive up in their car sometimes. They would actually sort of walk in, walk out, maybe be parked nearby. Because they didn't want their vehicles to be seen and be associated with a robbery, so they would park their vehicle at some distance. And then run off back to the vehicle. So that seems in some ways to be consistent with what happened. So as you can see, it's always a lot of possibilities with this case. That's one of the problems. So uh, Marie actually was responding to Allison when she commented, did any of the questioned suspects have a connection to the area where Jane's car was found? So it's found that by this park and speedway, anyone linked up there that we know about. So the answer to Marie's question is no, that, not that we know about, but there is a weird chop shop angle, I think. Somebody once told us a story without any evidence to support it. Uh, This story was that one of the people who lived on that street had some sort of affiliation with a chop shop. These were shops where they would take 
I call them shops. They're not, they're not like a place where you go and buy something. Yeah, I think people know what a chop shop is. So uh, a chop shop is where they take a car and they basically break it up into parts and sell it. And so the thinking was that the person who lives near here is affiliated with a chop shop. And so it was this person's responsibility to take Jane's car and dispose of it. There you go. But there was no evidence offered to back up that claim. And I think at some point we took a look at the history of everybody who lived on that street. And we didn't find anyone who had any sort of a criminal record that would suggest such activity. Yeah, we can't just go based on like somebody claiming one thing and then having nothing to back it up. But that's that's ultimately just a dead end. Now, a listener named Nikki also asked, did any of the four employees have ties to Johnson County. We're talking now about the area where the bodies were found. Back then it was a wooded area. It's since been developed up. Did any of them have a connection down there or anyone else associated with this case have a connection down there? Uh, The answer to that is yes. So the robbery gang was primarily operating out of Johnson County. So they had connections to Franklin Greenwood where the, the murder site was somewhat near Greenwood off County line road. So that's something we've never been able to say, like, they have an absolute connection to this specific property or this specific area, but just generally the the general area. Uh, and there's uh, other connections, too. I feel like I've, we really need to do this explainer episode because there's another person associated with this case named Donald Forrester. He's a rapist and he confessed to the Burger Chef murders twice in the 80s. And as far as I'm concerned, he was lying. He got a lot of details wrong. But people saw his face in the paper and they say to this day, oh, they they got him. They just couldn't prove it. Donald Forrester earlier in his life had committed an act of sexual assault against uh, a young woman in an area relatively close to where the bodies were found. So he had a tie. Any other perps or possible perps, I should say? Uh, This location is very near uh, a high school. It was said to have been used as a lover's lane. Yes. So it's possible that several people were familiar with it. It's possible that the the abductors were on their way to somewhere else and just stopped here almost randomly. As far as the four kids from the Burger Chef, I don't believe any of them had a tie to this area. Jane's family was from Terre Haute originally. So she, you know, her people were from out of town. And then the other kids, Mark Flemons' family had moved from Indianapolis. The other two, yeah, I don't think anybody had any Johnson County ties that we're aware of, at least at this time. Obviously, if you're hearing any of this and you know more, then feel free to correct, you know, shoot us an email. But we're just looking at our notes and telling you what we know at this point. Heather outlines a scenario where the four kids are kidnapped and then a guy comes, a, a car thief essentially comes along and the theft of Jane's car is separate. It's a separate incident. Somebody just kind of, oh, no one's in the burger chef. This car's here. Let me grab it. Uh, because basically they go inside the restaurant, see the purses and find the car keys. And they realize at some point it's a bad idea and abandon it near the police station. I tend to think that that's a little bit too coincidental, to be honest, because what are the odds of them being abducted and murdered and also a car thief just stopping by? The way this scenario could work for me is that if it's a loosely integrated group kidnapping them and some people are more focused on the kidnapping and maybe there's some hangers on, some lookouts, if you will, who then decide maybe we should take the car and then they think better of it. If if they're associated with the kidnapping in some way, that makes more sense for me as far as that theory. I will note crazy coincidences do happen. So it's not outside the realm of possibility. And for whatever it's worth, we should note that across the street from the Burger Chef was uh, a shopping center that had an under 21 club and some other businesses. And Supposedly, according to newspaper accounts, sometime that evening, theorized around midnight, a vehicle was stolen from that shopping center's parking lot. So there was at least one car thief working in the area at about that time. And where was that car found abandoned again? 
that car was found uh, abandoned, uh, not terribly far from uh, the home of one of the members of the robbery gang, maybe like a five, ten minute drive from his home. So that's suspicious. So, Heather, you may be on to something. I said it was a bit of a stretch, but weird things do happen. And there seems to have at least been some people wanting to steal cars in the area that night. And I could also definitely see a situation where maybe I'm like the junior member of the gang. I I, I think this is all wild. We're just going to rob these guys and leave them tied up in the woods. No one's going to die. I'm going to go joyriding. And then like later on it, oh my God, they killed everybody. You know, I, I, could, I could see a scenario like that. Let's get into the keys. Let's get into Jane's car keys. One thing we didn't mention earlier is that a baffling element of this case, when we talk about the car being left someone, somewhere weird, Jane's car keys were still in her pocket when she her body was found. So we we asked about that last time. We got some surprising responses that we'll save to the end, but I want to kind of go through some of the responses we got about what the deal with the keys is. A listener from Michigan pointed out that the way we describe Jane's car keys, it almost sounds like just a single key, which why would someone just have a single key? Why wouldn't they have it on their keychain if it's their car keys? So he was ba- he was basically indicating could she have had a spare key in her pocket and maybe the killer got away with the real keys the the keychain or could at the auto shop they made a duplicate for some nefarious purpose that's that's very possible especially what you say about the car shop making an extra duplicate for nefarious purposes there was a, a car shop in the area that was known for doing that. Yes. And Eddie also asked about the possibility of that. You know, could they have been made outside of her knowledge for whatever reason at the mechanic shop or, or by someone she trusted? So that's always an interesting possibility. And a listener named Cindy also said that back in the 70s, there would be like these magnetic hide a key boxes could be under the bumper beside the windshield wipers and she noted that back then it was really easy to lock yourself out of a car so it's possible a lot of people had these and maybe the killers just knew to kind of look for that and got lucky uh along these lines both uh, talking about the the possible hiding place of a key or a spare key anya mentioned earlier that jane's brother jimmy freet was heavily involved in the drug trade. Over the years, a number of people have speculated that Jimmy Freed himself played some sort of role in events that night, that perhaps he was either an additional victim or near victim who was able to escape, or perhaps he was one of the perpetrators, or perhaps he unknowingly set things into motion. And you may think, who would do that to their sister? Who wouldn't like come forward about their sister's death if they knew more? We know from talking with people that this is a guy who let his roommate hold a knife to his young son's throat. So he's not exactly the best family man in the world, frankly, to be blunt. And I'll, 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 note, I'll make the obvious point that he might know where his sister hides a key. If his sister trusts someone with a spare key, perhaps she trusts her brother with it. Yes. So an anonymous listener actually pointed out that th- that there's kind of a few different con- contradictory statements about where the car was. And this listener noted that in order to make the car situation make sense, there was an outlier. The outlier was the one report where Jane's car was already missing at 1130. And given that this basically most... Most of the other statements indicated that the car is definitely missing around midnight. Is that right, Kevin? Yes. So that one's 30 minutes earlier. And this this anonymous listener points out, I think rightfully, that you have to throw out the outlier. People make mistakes. People don't realize the time. People miss things. Witness accounts are highly, highly flawed. And if everybody's saying one thing, one person is saying the other thing, it's not that that person's lying or bad or doing anything wrong. It's just... You kind of have to look at the majority, in my opinion. So I would agree with this assessment. And they also ask, could could Jane have had two keys? 
We've tried to look into the key issue. We haven't really been able to get a lot more information from our sources on that. So I wish, but we have gotten some information from some of our listeners that we're going to talk about now that actually could help illuminate matters. Yes. One another, one other anonymous listener, I will say, said a 1974 Chevrolet Vega would have most likely two keys, one key for the doors and trunk and the other for the ignition. The key, one key would have an oval head and that would operate the doors and the key with the square head would do the ignition. So if she just had one key on her, which one is it? So let's get into the, the keys to the mystery. A listener named Stephanie said they, in my experience, could continue to drive the car without a key. Back in the day, we could just pull the key out of our old cars and they would just keep running until the key was reinserted and turned back to the starting position. My mom had ADHD and would always forget her stuff in the house. In the winter, she'd just yank her keys from the ignition to get back in the front door, but leave the engine on to warm us kids. It was a trick she learned on my grandpa's car lot for test drives. Those particular cars were Buicks. One in one was a 70s Skylark. So thank you to Stephanie and your mother. That's very interesting. And it's also backed up by another listener named Ken. He says, I just listened to your podcast about the Burger Chef murders. I owned a 1974 Chevy Vega. I can tell you that it had issues with the ignition switch. I discovered that you could remove the key from the ignition at any time, even if the engine was running. I don't know if this was a GM issue, but it was convenient for my friends and I back in high school. I can see where a criminal would use it to their advantage if they were aware of it. They had this Vega from 1981 to 1983, and the ignition had seven to nine years of use to it when it was happening. Wow. Okay. Like that, that kind of, I mean, the fact that you could just basically not require the key seems highly relevant here that would uh, that would illuminate things because she the key doesn't have to be in the ignition for people to drive it so that gives us uh food for thought yes we we've talked extensively about how the speedway police department did not do a good job with the initial investigation into this case and that by the time that adults took over the case it essentially was too late because a lot of evidence was destroyed the following question gets into a piece of evidence that we don't know if police collected or what the situation with this is, but we thought it was a really good question, so we wanted to mention it. Ryan asks, I wonder if the police got hold of the phone records from Burger Chef to see what calls came in and out. Uh, my workplace had phones that employees were allowed to use for a short personal calls. That's uh, a great question. We don't know if the police obtained those records. Certainly some of the stories I've heard about what may have happened that night over the years involves details about calls coming to or from the Burger Chef at different times during that evening. I've always wondered if police had phone records which would confirm or debunk those stories. And unfortunately, we don't know. The state police have refused to share access to even redacted versions of their files. The only person outside of the agency that they have allowed to view those files is uh, a podcaster, and they did that in violation of uh, state laws. In any other case, I would think, of course they looked at the phone records. That's so basic. Here? I don't know. They bungled this. This was a bungled case. There's no there's no being nice about it. I'm, I, I mean, we've tried to be as fair and judicious as possible on this show, but this was a disaster by the standards of 1970s policing. Yes. Not by our modern day standards. When you hear about people in the 50s throwing out DNA evidence, it's understandable because that was a long way off. But this was 1978. These people knew what fingerprints were and they botched it. An anonymous listener wrote us a whole scenario. I'm going to just read parts of it. It's long and very interesting and detailed. And thank you to this person. You know who you are. I'm going to try to speculate, emphasis added, on the circumstances surrounding Jane's car using information in Pruitt's 1981 statement and the Lupine Drive report in the Indianapolis Star slash News. The Lupine Drive report, for, for our listeners who may not be familiar with, there were reports of a vehicle going down Lupine Drive, which is right near where Ruth Shelton lived, tragically, and kids screaming in the car. 
So that could have been people joyriding on a Friday night. Maybe it's connected. We don't know. It's impossible to say at this point. Pruitt claimed that Tim Willoughby, Ruth and Jane left in Jane's car and turned east on Crawford's Road out of the restaurant parking lot. And then the other group is Jeff Reed. He's abducting Danny and Mark in an orange van. If you believe Pruitt, it seems that Marianne must have also been in the van. Marianne Higginbotham was Tim Willoughby's girlfriend at the time. She was she went missing in 1978 and was found murdered in 1979. Tim Willoughby, for what it's worth, has never been found. He may be a victim of murder himself. He may have been a perpetrator in Marianne's case. He may be a perpetrator in the Burger Chef case. It's just impossible to say. So in this scenario, Tim and Jeff, or whoever the perpetrators are, force Jane to jump to dump the Vega in the 5500 block of West 15th Street next to Leonard Park around 1.30 a.m. on the morning of November 18th. Leonard Park being the park and speedway where it was found, to be clear. If she was driving, when she gets out, she locks the door and puts the key, it's never been specified which one or both, in her coat pocket, locking the door behind her. Whoever was riding shotgun or in the backseat didn't lock their door when they got out. That's true. That The passenger side door was found unlocked. If there were three people in the car at the time, the backseat passenger would have likely been the last out since the car was a two-dark coupe and the backseat passenger would have had exited by pushing one of the front bucket seats backs forward. And then they all basically get into the van, go up to the Hager property off 6623 West Stone Crossing Road in northwest Johnson County. Your witness places it, places gunshots around 2 a.m. around there, but... As this as this writer points out, that that is not it's it's very shaky in terms of the timeline. But basically what this person is saying, what this anonymous listener is saying, is that they do think there was a period of driving around on back roads trying to figure out what to do. Basically give, giving the impression that this was a spur of the moment thing and not very well planned out. I think all of this seems highly possible to me. The turn onto that lover's lane area was a split second decision not being familiar with the area, thinking that, okay, this looks isolated, even though, as this writer points out, there were houses actually pretty close. So it was in some ways a stupid idea to go down this road. Another full-fledged scenario from a listener named Matt, who writes very nice things about our podcast. Thank you, Matt. They, They have a question. I'm writing directly because in the reporting I've seen, everyone seems to gloss over the employee with the van that called in only to arrive at the restaurant later. Can you direct me to an episode or source for this information, including possible names or other images of the van? Oh, man, Matt, you're opening a can of worms here. We're going to do more reporting on it. We might have some suggestions for you that we can pass on later, depending on some things that are out of our control. It's certainly referred to in the FBI documents that were recently released. That's probably the best source for now. For what it's worth, we've had... Not recently, but in the past, we have had extensive talks with this person, this employee. And we hope to have more talks with this employee in the future. And we we will we will do some work on this and try to get you this information. A lot of it is unclear. We don't know the make and model of the van. We don't. And we don't have a photo of it. And I believe when we talked to this employee, they didn't remember the make and model of their van. Nor did, uh, if I recall correctly, nor did Brian Kring. Uh, Kring was the employee who... Interacted with this employee. Yes, at the crime scene. Yes. When Brian Kring arrived and sounded the alarm about everyone being missing, this employee rolled up too. Brian Kring has always, has, has recently maintained that they found the whole incident really suspicious, but nobody seems to remember what the actual car was. And then they also ask, I wonder. I would wonder if the park where the Vega was found near the police station might have been a known drug or illegal substance pickup or hangout spot. Parks in my areas have been notorious for this. If the perpetrators were at that location with the van and a couple of them either drove northwest to park to park near the tracks and then walked the path to the Donuts and Burger Chef to the Dunkin' Donuts and Burger Chef, or even walked the entirety from the park to the tracks coming from east to west, they could have forced Jane to drive all victims back to the park to move to the van. This seems possible. And this also, uh, this Matt notes that they're not a conspiracy theorist, but they, when George Nichols describes one of the two individuals who approached him, of course, the bearded man and the clean-shaven man, saying, you're going to have to leave here. There's been a lot of vandalism around here. 
This seems like something a police or security officer might say. Yes. We've noted that, too. A lot of people note that that does sound like something a police officer would say. It's a very interesting observation. And there are all sorts of stories and suggestions about who those people may have been. There are, I've heard people speculate, and this is wild speculation, that they were undercover officers of some kind. And that is very wild speculation. We've never found anything like that. Never found any proof of that, and we've certainly looked. So speaking of George Nichols and Mary Ryan, as a background, those two were teenagers who were, Mary Ryan was an employee of the Dunkin' Donuts next to the Burger Chef. She was working that night. Her boyfriend, George Nichols, comes up. They hang out outside of the Dunkin' Donuts. They sit outside near the tracks, drink some whiskey, smoke some weed, and two men approach them. One is a guy with a clean-shaven face, and the other was, is a bearded man. They have this strange interaction where they talk about vandalism, and then the two kids get out of there. And they describe walking around the Burger Chef weirdly. The, the movements are somewhat strange. Let's get into Mary Ryan. One anonymous listener says... I found it interesting that November 17th, 1978 appears to have been Mary's last night of employment at Dunkin' Donuts. This is something that's sort of alluded to in the FBI documents, right, Kevin? Yes. We find that odd, too. On her last night of work, there happens to be this incident where she happens to be a crucial witness. Alan Pruitt, who is another witness that night... He later tells police that there was supposed to be inside job robberies at the Burger Chef, the Dunkin' Donuts, and across the street, the American Inn. He doesn't refer to it as the American Inn. It's a very sleazy motel. He refers to it as the Golden Eagle. He doesn't remember what the name was, but there's a Golden Eagle statue outside of it, I believe. So, strangely enough, the person that Alan Pruitt was hanging out while he was drunk at the Dunkin' Donuts with that night is... Mary Ryan's ex-boyfriend. So there's a lot of weird stuff going on where just people are happening to be there and it could mean nothing, but it's just odd. Frankly, it's odd. A listener named Ted said that he enjoys our broadcast. Well, thank you, Ted. He also notes that he worked at the Burger Chef in Brownsburg in the 60s. One of the people you interviewed was a lady who stated that she was smoking pot behind the restaurant next door to the Burger Chef at the time of the abduction. She was not a very good witness and appears to be very confused, but she speaks of her boyfriend at the time who was with her behind the restaurant. Ted wanted to know, have we ever interviewed George Nichols? Have have, you, have we broadcast it? We've talked to George a lot. We never did like a full-fledged released interview with him. I will say in defense of George and Mary, I think aspects of their story are uh, shaky. Mary has told us that she purposely – was misleading when describing the clean-shaven man. And the sketches are very vague and unhelpful, frankly. But their stories, at the very least, seem consistent in the FBI documents. Yeah, uh, I met George for the first time, maybe in 2018, 2019. And the story he told me then was basically the same story he told the FBI back in 1978. So you can say something for consistency, in fairness. One group of people that we heard a lot from were the fast food alumni, people who have worked at fast food at different times, and they weighed in on some of the strangeness around things going on at the Burger Chef. A few items that we released was that a young employee had recently been fired at the time of the murders, and they apparently – there's allusions to him having issues with Jane Freed. This employee, we believe, is the same employee who showed up in a van that night to help close. The FBI documents indicate that this person had not been informed that they were fired yet. So now we're going to hear from some former fast food workers weighing in on all of that. A a listener named Nathan, who worked in fast food in the 1990s to mid-2000s, said that in his opinion, a manager calling in an employee that late to help with closing seems odd. If they had an employee there to take his spot, then they weren't shorthanded. If this person coming in late was going to clock in, that means they'd be paying another employee with no revenue coming in as the store was closed. That would hurt profits and would possibly get a manager in trouble. And then they also note, obviously things may have been looser in the 70s, but in examining this angle would be useful to consider what proper management procedures were at the time. We actually know some Burger Chef managers from back in the day, so maybe we can ask them about this. How odd would this be? Because – 
Nathan points out a good point. Maybe it's looser back then. Maybe by the 90s, you know, fast food homicides were occurring more often. So it's possible that things got more stringent. Whenever we're looking at fast food homicides, though, young men who were recently fired or in trouble at work are certainly a huge red flag, especially teenagers. Um, a listener named Lydia weighed in saying it was definitely looser in the late 70s, 80s when she worked in fast food. Closing was an all hands on deck situation and cash was secured immediately at close. So we frequently had employees who knew how to prep the fryers for the next day, come back. It was a very specific job. So possibility that that would be more normal back in the day. Lydia also notes that given how gossipy fast food is, especially when you're dealing with a lot of teenagers and young people, she would be not so surprised if this employee had heard that he was fired from somebody, even though he had not been formally told at that time. That's a great point. That's a great point. Nathan also replied, I could see a scenario where maybe this person knew he was being fired and gave inside information to others on how to rob the place. Also very pertinent. It doesn't have to be someone's directly involved, but if they make a comment and then things spiral out of control, that could fit some of what we're seeing. Tanya said when she worked in the when she worked fast food in the 90s, they had two closers and a managers. Most of the closing was done before we actually closed and before the full kitchen staff let out. After close, we only had about 30 to 60 minutes left, depending on how many late customers we had. And she worked at Hardee's, which, of course, is the successor of Burger Chef. It bought the Burger Chef chain. Lonnie said it's still common today for coworkers, friends coming in to close to help you know, friends get out as early as possible so they could go hang out. So that's also another possibility, a social sort of thing. Like, let's go, let's go a party. It's a Friday night. Yeah. Jessica said, wasn't there something about him being fired, but they hadn't notified him yet? I wonder if they said, yeah, come on in so they could deliver the bad news to his face. Although Nathan did dispute that, just saying you wouldn't want to fire somebody that late at night. That that would be kind of bad. And uh, and then Tanya pointed out that this employee had been reprimanded. So, yeah, it's very possible he had a sense that something's wrong, even, even if he doesn't know he's fired. Brian worked at a popular restaurant in rural Indiana in high school in, when, in the 1990s. And he said that hundreds of students from schools within a five – within a 50 mile radius would come in on game nights. So he's saying that if it could be somebody who is known to the restaurant or, or kind of scopes it out, it could be a wide variety of people. I don't know how much of a hangout the burger chef was though. seems like it was maybe a little bit, but they had different options in Speedway. It wasn't like one main restaurant. I think they, people could go to different places. And, of course, there was the Galaxy Underage Club across the street. True. You had to pay a cover charge to get in. And then the listener named Cindy, she said she could easily see the manager saying, yes, come on in and help us clean up, because she did plan to fire him that night, and she probably thought, I'll just go ahead and fire him. Plus, if he doesn't report to help clean, it is another reason to terminate him. So some different discussions, some different ideas with that. Now we're getting into our end game. We're going to talk about the murder scene and some of the thoughts people have had on that. Can you give us a quick overview, Kevin, of how each of the four were murdered and how strange the scene was? So Ruth and Danny were found next to each other. They'd been killed by gunshot wounds. Jane was found a short distance away. She died from a knife wound. She'd been stabbed in the heart. Twice. Twice. And uh, she'd been stabbed with such force that the blade was actually broken off inside her body. And then a short distance away from that, uh, in more in a wooded uh, area, Mark Flemons was discovered. He'd suffered some uh, injuries to his face. And due to the position, he fell when he was knocked out. He ended up suffocating on his own blood. And it's crucial to point out that whatever beating he suffered would not have killed him. It, it was not a fatal beating. He died because the position he lay, his his head was uh, in such a position that he died. He suffocated on his own blood. When we look at the scene, we can see two things, two possibilities. We see either there was some sort of malfunction with a gun. We see that 
either Mark and or Jane ran for it. Once Ruth and Danny were shot or once the shooting started, they ran for it and then were killed with whatever, maybe the gun jams, maybe they're just killed with whatever else is on hand. We can also see that possibly either Mark or Jane or both were separated from the group and killed in specific ways. So that the how you interpret this depends on whether you think any one employee was a target or no one was a target, but just something went wrong. But that's those are the possibilities that we sort of have weighed over over time. Some people had some thoughts on Mark's death. Mark, I want to note, was the youngest victim. He was also the only victim who went to Speedway High School, and he was the only black victim. So it always has stood out to me that he was beaten instead of shot or killed with a knife. And a listener named Lisa said, was the person who was bludgeoned, Mark, was he the one who reported the shenanigans behind the burger chef that got the employee fired? What she's alluding to is in the FBI documents, there was an allusion to the employee who got fired but didn't know it yet. They might have been doing something they shouldn't have been bef- behind the burger chef. We assumed it was drug related, but was Mark the one who perhaps told on him? We've not found any indication of that. And, and honestly, what we know about Mark, I don't think so. He might have occasionally, like many teenagers do, occasionally smoked a bit of pot. So I, I don't think he'd be the guy to snitch on somebody for doing something that, you know, is not a huge deal. There, and there's also been some speculation that perhaps Mark really wasn't beaten, that he ran into a tree which knocked him unconscious. We've always had a problem with this because it sounds so ridiculous, but we actually heard from a listener. Why don't you read us yeah. what listener Amy had to say? Amy told us, it's not a huge deal, but when I was really young, I was running away from my mom for fun. I was looking back at her and then turned around and ran straight into a tree. My nose bled everywhere. That was the image that I had when I heard about the victim who may have hit a tree. He could have been checking behind him, not realizing a tree was coming up. I know it's not helpful, but it's something to think about. Actually, I, I would say it is helpful, Amy, because we've often discounted that because it just sounds like ridiculous, but maybe it's not. Maybe you have to go with a possibility. And I, I think it tells us something about what happened when we realize that in all likelihood, at the time the the abductors left the crime scene, Mark Flemons was still alive, either because he'd run into a tree and got knocked out and they couldn't find him or they beat him and left him. It took him a while to asphyxiate on his own blood. And so for all they knew when they left, they were leaving behind a living witness. So perhaps they left in a hurry, in a panic, but, uh, yeah, he was still alive when they left. Probably. An anonymous listener also highlighted these possibilities. What if the plan was to get them all far away and leave them there alive to delay discovery? The young man who asphyxiated on his own blood might have run. They knocked him out, put him in a position to tie him up, but maybe the person had to go back for rope, and by the time they returned to the spot, he was dead. Now they have to clean up. Maybe the young woman who was the manager who was walked off to be killed because she was showing leadership or was otherwise in need of subduing first. Did the odd body position of the young man who asphyxiated look like it was an attempt to, at hog tying or tying his feet and hands together? Or what if there was a fantasy element to this and the killer, part of a team, had envisioned a scene in the woods and was taking out the opportunity to c- create that or play it out? So none of the victims were bound, and nor is there any indication that they had been bound at any point. This is a key point because some of the confessions that have come up over the years involve them being tied up with wire but their ligature marks would show on your wrists or ankles, and there are none here. And frankly, that's been a bit of baffling because when you have four people essentially free, you're having to use other forms of coercion to get them to cooperate with you, and it becomes more risky. So what we've never seen photos of the bodies. What the photo the position of Mark's body that has been described to us is almost as if he was running and someone pulled him down so that his knees bent and his feet were under him. And not like, I don't think it was necessarily an attempt to tie him up. I I think it was more of like he's yanked down and then 
something happens or he collapses down if he ran into a tree. What do you think, Kevin? This case is just so confusing. There's so many interesting possibilities. I feel there's very little we can dismiss. Yeah. And I think just having a conversation about the possibilities is interesting. One thing I think that's really interesting about what this listener is pointing out is that the possibility that Mark's death actually happened first and then spurred the other deaths to, you know, oh, no, somebody's dead. Now we have to kill everybody. I think that speaks to a situation that's run out of control, which frankly seems to me how this all played out. I also think another way this could play out is people who do the kidnapping expect to tie them up in the woods or leave them in the woods and move on. And then somebody shows up who's affiliated with it and says, now we have to kill everybody. We've committed kidnapping. Like you've made this so much worse. And there are differences in opinion amongst the people who ultimately become the killers about how to handle this situation. And that speaks to some of the frenetic nature of like, maybe we don't have enough bullets. Maybe, you know, maybe one of the gun malfunctions and, and, you know, another possibility that's always come up to me is that if Jane was targeted in some way, she's being threatened with a knife, something happens with that, and then everybody else has to die. So great thoughts, everybody. Moving on to the motives for murder in general that we've received from people. A listener named Brian said, it seems to me that whomever murdered Jane may have been jealous or enraged by a bad romantic relationship. As we mentioned, Jane was with she was with a man at the time she was dating a man, although we've heard that their relationship may have been waning at that point for a number of reasons. I'm open to anything, and, and certainly this could be the case. And I could see maybe there being another reason for the murders, but somebody's more obsessed with Jane, and that's why she died in such a brutal, knifing fashion. The problem for me with it just being a random stalker, even though she was receiving creepy phone calls at the time, is that she, you know, is a young woman who would be driving to work late at night, early in the morning. Why not just stalk her from the restaurant and grab her when she is getting out of her car or something? I don't know in the situation. If you are obsessed with Jane and it's a romantic type stalking relationship situation, Why do you want to get three additional people involved in that who are going to be harder to control than one young woman? I But that being said, I think the possibility that Jane is the focus or there may be some sort of creepy obsession with Jane by the killer could be borne out by the fact that she was stabbed. And that's so much more personal and angry than shooting somebody, in my opinion. What do you think? Uh, And I think... You can make similar arguments about Mark Flemons. If he was the target, he lived relatively nearby the Burger Chef and walked to and from work, often late at night. You would think an opportunity when he's walking by himself would be a good time to grab him. Yeah. The fact that if one person is the sole target, it doesn't really make sense to do it where you're going to get a whole group of employees unless – There's something about the burger chef itself that is being targeted or unless, frankly, the target is Jane and you're thinking that I can coerce her to give me money from the burger chef and then things escalate out of hand and you're using her employees as hostages. But I I don't know. It's a good it's a good thought and it's good to think about, like, what could have been motivating this? A listener named George said it is plain common sense that the employee fired for dealing the previous evening was the killer. Plain to see is also connected to the local PD or the mob. And that is why the phony robbery crew story was concocted. What a coincidence they're dead. Dead people don't talk. Position of the body suggests the beat to death victim was getting killed in front of the others and the other victims ran and then they were killed. Interesting thoughts. Um, I, so a few, not a, two members of the robbery gang are still alive. Greg Steinke and Tim Piccioni are still around and kicking as far as we know. As far as we know. Also, I would say... We've actually talked to somebody who survived the robbery gang. So the robbery crew was absolutely operating. That's not a myth. The police didn't make that up. Ken York is some, he overstates the case in the newspapers. Ken York is the Indiana State police investigator who was one of the main forces behind the uh, robbery gang theory. He overstated and exaggerated in newspaper quotes. So George is on the money with that. But 
we talked to employees who had been robbed by these guys and they thought they were going to die. Th- these were not nice robberies. These were not like, we're not going to hurt you. I mean, it was like, you know, don't look at me or I'll shoot. You know, like they were, these kids were absolutely traumatized. I mean, they, one kid we talked to, they ambushed him as he was taking the garbage out. They put a gun to the back of his head. They forced him inside. It was a very scary situation. And so I don't want to underplay what they were doing. And we put that interview on the podcast. Yeah, that interview is on the podcast. But at the same time, I think uh, I definitely think that Ken York overstated some things about the, you know, one thing about like this being a a lot of people want to believe it's a conspiracy, a a police conspiracy. And frankly, at this point, I would love that because then we could point to like, what, what, what the hell happened here? Why wasn't it solved? But we don't have any evidence of that. And we're not going to come to that conclusion without any evidence. Things that seem nefarious can often be explained by incompetence. And I think that's what happened here. But again, we're open. Like if somebody has information saying police corruption and it's more than just a vibe that you're getting, we're interested. Let us know. I We also don't have any knowledge of the employee who was fired being connected to the local PD or mob. We can't really uh, we can't really necessarily go with that. As for the the beat to death victim getting killed in front of the others and the others ran. It doesn't look like Ruth and Danny ran. And with Jane, it's been described to us as as if she was walked away and that somebody stabbed her twice in the chest before she even knew what hit her. There was no signs of a struggle with her. Like someone was behind her and reached around. Reached around, boom, boom, and and she's dead before, you know, she's not incredibly bloody. It doesn't look like a prolonged situation. It's like a blitz attack. So... I don't know, but it's it's a good it's a good way to think about it. And listen, George, we're interested in in possible police conspiracies. So if you know anything, let us know. And if anyone else knows anything, please let us know. Because I mean, I really can't underscore enough how badly the Speedway police bungled this whole situation. But I tend to think without seeing anybody saying, "Okay, here's who they were protecting or here's why they were doing that." I have to just think that it was sheer incompetence and people not doing their jobs pop properly a listener named nikki said the plan wasn't really to kill them initially everything goes awry somebody shoots ruth and danny the other two make a run for it maybe mark's hit with a baseball back or, or something that was convenient and uh jane is caught and stabbed i think a listener named allison makes similar points yes Allison, I'll just read briefly because something about this I really wanted to highlight. Question was asked, why didn't they just kill them all at the restaurant if that was their plan? I think that's the thing. It wasn't their plan. I think these were young and experienced perpetrators who might have had the only intention of robbing the place. Then things went south. It explains potentially why they left the restaurant. They didn't have a good plan. They might have had knowledge that someone could stop by, so they decided to abduct the employees. Or they thought they could take the employees to a remote location and scare them into silence. Which then they may have realized that, oops, that's not really possible, so we may need to kill them all instead. I think Allison's – I think Allison's onto something here. I think this matches with what I think in terms of stupid, young, scared perpetrators who get lucky. I think a lot of you – maybe all of you are onto something here. I think all of you – we want to underscore. For all of you, we want to say how grateful we are that you're using your creativity and time and thoughts to put together scenarios and share them with us. And we hope that by sharing them with all of you back, we can all think about things and hone down things and debunk things or say, actually, no, this is true. Confirm things. So hopefully this is a positive exercise for all of us to go through with the Burger Chef case and just kind of keep the discussion out there. So If you have thoughts, weigh in. Let us know if we can use your first name or if you want to be totally anonymous or go by a nickname or whatever. And keep us posted on what you're thinking. We'll be putting out more Burger Chef episodes based on the FBI files, so there'll be more topics to cover soon. But thank you all so much. From the bottom of our hearts, I mean, this case means so much to Kevin and I. So the fact that so many people weighed in and shared their thoughts, it actually makes me want to cry. So thank you. Um, You guys are great. And Every one of you who submitted a question had great thoughts and great, interesting perspectives, and we value all of you. Thanks so much for listening to The Murder Sheet. If you have a tip concerning one of the cases we cover, please email us at murdersheet 
at gmail.com. If you have actionable information about an unsolved crime, please report it to the appropriate authorities. If you're interested in joining our Patreon, that's available at www.patreon.com slash murder sheet. If you want to tip us a bit of money for records requests, you can do so at www.buymeacoffee.com slash murder sheet. We very much appreciate any support. Special thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for the murder sheet and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. If you're looking to talk with other listeners about a case we've covered, you can join the Murder Sheet discussion group on Facebook. We mostly focus our time on research and reporting, so we're not on social media much. We do try to check our email account, but we ask for patience as we often receive a lot of messages. Thanks again for listening.